Hold on a sec. I don't want to do that. Okay. So we'll begin. Yesterday we read the portion of Balak, where um, it, it, it continues where it left off the week before, where, where the Jewish people, they had asked the Emirates permission to, to just go through the land and go into Israel. And the Emirates said, not only, um, not only are we not going to give you permission to go into our land, but they wage war with them. Um, you know, the, the, the Israelites had no beef with, with the Amorites, but the Amorites clearly had a beef. And, and um, so they decimated the Amorites and they conquered their cities. And now the neighboring, the neighbors, they're not in Israel yet, but the neighbors outside of Israel, the, the Moab and, and Sihon, they said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, look what they did to the Amorites, we're going to attack. They're going to attack us. They're going to attack the Moabites. Now, it's, it's, they have, the Jewish people had a clear instruction from God that they were not allowed to attack the Moabites. Reason being is that Mo, the Moabites come from Lot, which was Abraham's nephew, which is family. So they were told not to attack the Moabites. And, and in addition, um, Rus, the, 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 the um, ancestor of King David, comes from Moab. So, and, and, and David was the, you know, David was the king of Israel and Mashiach, et cetera, et cetera. So to, to, um, to attack, to attack the um, Moabites would have been bad. It would have been wrong. It would have been, uh, you know, it would have been basically cutting your nose to spite your face. But the, um, the, 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 um, they, were, they were afraid that the bottom line is they were going to get attacked and there could have been some rogue Jews that attacked them. So the king, whose name was Balak, who wasn't really the king of Moab, it's just he was, as it's taught in the commentaries in the Talmud, that he was a rabid anti-Semite. And because he was so outspoken, he was crowned as their leader. But he wasn't even from Moab. He was an outside interloper. He was an agitator. You know, an outside agitator reminds me of um, in, in 1991 when they had the Crown Heights riots. So the, the, the youth led by Sharpton, who walked down Eastern Parkway throwing rocks at, at the shawl and at people and hardly, the minority were from Crown Heights. But the Crown Heights, you know, a couple of thugs, I'm sure, but the people, the residents of Crown Heights, they didn't want this. They didn't want a, a pogrom or a riot on their streets. It all came from the outside. So that's just a, um, you know, just, just an interesting. So this is the same idea. Balak was from the outside. And um, the Torah uses the term by Yakats, that Moab was not, it doesn't use, doesn't, it uses by Yagar, they were afraid. But by Yakats, by Yakats mean they were disgusted. So here you see as anti Semitic. Being afraid is not anti Semitism. Being disgusted shows a racist quality. Oh, they're not like us, and therefore they disgust us. And um, so Moab said to Midian, Moab and Midian were enemies, neighboring, neighboring countries. But Moab said to Midian, you know, we got to forge together. We got to, we got to um, defeat Israel. So there you see, and uh, you see that, that um, this happened in 1967 with the war against Israel, history repeats itself, five countries got together who hated each other. And they got together and they decided they are going to wage war against Israel. Same thing, Moab and Midian, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they, they um, Balak, who was, who was the, uh, the king of the Amorites, got together with Midian and they sent a message to a prophet, a non-Jewish prophet called Bilam. Now, non-Jewish, the, the Jews had prophets, the non-Jews the non-Jews had prophets. The prophets, um, so therefore the non-Jews can never say we had a disaffair, you know, we had a disadvantage, unfair. We didn't have our prophet. We had a prophet. Bilam was a bona fide prophet. 
He could commune with God just like a Jewish prophet can, not like Moses. Moses had the ability to have prophecy while being conscious, but other prophets of Israel, they were in a um, you know, semi-conscious state. Bilam was in a semi-conscious state, but still a prophet. So the, the Balak, the king of Moab, a Morite, and, and, and um, I'm sorry, the king of Moab sent a message to Bilam, was an Amorite, to say, look, these people came out from Israel. Behold, there are many, and they are numerous. Now, please curse for me, these people, because I know whoever you curse is cursed, and whoever you bless is blessed. Drive them out of the land. So there's a few things here that we need to talk about. First of all, he said, curse for me. Why for me? Curse for the people. Curse for, the, for, for everybody who lives in the neighborhood in the Middle East, right? Why for me particular? So what Bollock was saying is, um, look, curse me. I know my ancestry is going to be Ruth. And I know, um, I know um, that, that um, King David is going to come out of Ruth. So curse me. Curse me that I should not have kids. Curse me that, I, that Ruth should not come out from me. And therefore, by cursing me, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be saving us in the future. Curse me. As well as its meaning, curse, you know, for me, for our people. And, um, and he says, for I know you'll be whoever you bless or curse shall be cursed, blessed shall be blessed, etc. How does he know? So it's interesting that there's a commentary that Bilam's, Bilam's comes from Lavan family. And Lavan blessed Rebecca, who was going to marry Isaac. And he said, curse, uh, and, and he blessed Rebecca. And he said, you are not just going to be a mother of a few. You're going to be mother of, of, mother of a nation. You are going to um, you know, lead a people. So he says, so we know your blessings come to fruition. How about your curses? Do they come to fruition? So, so he says, so curse for me. And he sent messengers of Moab, messengers of Midian, and they came to Bilam and they said, curse. And Bilam said, I got to have a prophecy to let, to let me know if it's the right thing. So Bilam laid down and God said to him, who are these people? What do they want? He says, well, it, it, the king sent me and he said that he was going to honor me greatly if I cursed the Jewish people. So okay. God said, forget about it. Don't, don't go. These people are blessed. So he gets up in the morning and he tells to the messengers, of Balak and the messengers of, in other words, Moab and Midian, the chieftains, he said, no, I can't go. God doesn't allow me. So Balak sent greater people, generals this time, not just mere captains or lieutenants. He sent generals. And he says, okay, let me talk to God again. God came to him and, and he says, um, you know what? You know what? Let me give you enough rope to hang yourself with. Go. If that's what you want to do, go. Which, as we discussed yesterday um, at the High Center during, during the Torah reading, is that this is the way God works. If you really want something, God is going to give it to you. Right? We see this from Adam and Eve. God could have blocked the tree, but they really wanted it, so God let them. We see this um, by Pharaoh. Right, God, that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. We see this by the spies. You know, Moshe said, okay, if you want to go, go. So it was, it was, if you want to go, then go. So here, Bilam said the same thing. You want to go. However, it's whatever I tell you to say, you're going to say. So, so um, Bilam comes to, to these chieftains and um, he says, okay, God lets me go. He says, however, whatever God tells me to do, I can do. And, um, and even if you give me all the money, gold and silver in the world, I would not be able to stray from what God wants. So there was no mention of money 
There was just a mention of, I will honor you, but Bilam translated, translated that into dollars and cents. That God is going to, the, 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 the Bilam, the Balak wants to honor him with money. So it, it reminds me of, there was a, a fellow who lived in Dix Hills when I first moved in, who was eccentric. And one day he comes into my office and uh, I can't tell you I was all that busy. I didn't know too many people. And he says, can you drive me to Manhattan to the other side of the bridge of the Queensborough Bridge? I said, no. So he goes, I'll pay you. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I get in the car. And I get to the Queensboro Bridge, we drove over it. He says, okay, this is where I have, to, this is my stop. And it was one way and I could, I could go right back. And as he gets out of the car, he looked, he, you know, the windows roll down. He says, I'll pay you in mitzvahs. I'll pay you in mitzvahs. So um, and with that, he walked away. So I assumed money. And he assumed, no, I'll pay you in mitzvahs. I'll pay you back somehow. Anyway, so that's the same thing here. Um, so the same thing here is, is this, uh, Bilam guy thought money when it wasn't necessarily a hatchet it, 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 money, but, um, he, he, um, took it, he took it as money. I have a quick question. Yeah. What was that? God told the Israelites not to attack these people. Yeah. With all these prophecies, why didn't he just say, Hey, they were told not to attack, leave them alone. They're going to pass through and that'll be the end of it. Wouldn't that have been a whole lot easier? Yeah. So, so actually it's a good question. So there is, there is a commentary on it that says that God told the Israelites not to attack, but the mixed multitude, the thousands upon thousands that left with Israel did not fall under that banner. So they were afraid that even if the Israelites don't attack, are they going to be the Erev Rav? Are, going to be, are they going to be the mixed multitudes that came out with them that will attack? So, um, so, so even though they knew that they weren't supposed to attack because it's actually family. And it's interesting, by the way, one of the reasons why Moab was ultimately destroyed in the end by King David was because their family. And when the Jewish people came out of Egypt, they asked Moab, they said, please help us. Please help us. Bread, water. And they said, no, no, you are not to enter on our, our borders. Now they're family. So they, so they didn't help family. So they deserve to be attacked, but not then, not then. God said, for now, I still got to get Rus. I still got to get King David's grandmother. So you can't, you cannot, you cannot take care of them now. But they actually did deserve um, a reprisal because they did not help family members, right? Now, could you blame them? Who was Moab's? Who was who was who was the great grandfather of Moab? Lot. What did Lot do? He he he. Lot had sex with his two daughters. Which, if they can, if you, if a person can have sex with his two daughters, not protect his two daughters, you can't blame him for not, you know, feeding cousins, right? A, a, a father's responsibility is to save his kids, right? In fact, a, a, a father, a parent, would actually push the kid out of the way of an oncoming bus to save his kids. This guy screwed his kids, literally. So, so you can't expect them to be, you know, to be ethical, but so be it. So God said, go. So by Yakam Bilam Baboike, Bilam got up in the morning. So he got up early in the morning, right? Ready to roll. He says, oh, I, I'm going to get covered. I'm going to get honor, honor here. I'm going to be rewarded by the king of Balak, you know, the king Balak. I'm going to be rewarded. So he vayachvish es asoynoi, and he straddled, and saddled, and then straddled his donkey, right? And he went with Moab. Now there's a very similar verse. God told Abraham, "I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. I want you to offer him up." And the next verse is, Abram got up in the morning, and he saddled and straddled his donkey, 
exactly the same verse. However, instead of Avram has Bilam. So by Avram, the commentaries say, the Gemara, it's in the Talmud. By the mere fact, then by the mere fact that I, Abraham got up in the morning to saddle his donkey, to do God's bidding. God never said sacrifice, by the way. God said offer, elevate. God never said sacrifice, but Abraham didn't know that. But the mere fact that he got up in the morning was actually the, 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 the already the, the, um, the refua, the healing for the Jewish people. So it actually counterattacked. It was a pre-attack. It was a preemptive attack that Abraham did without him knowing by getting up in the morning and saddling his donkey is that that was a counterattack to Bilam's getting up in the morning and saddled his donkey. But God was furious. And the Torah tells us that God put an angel in the way and the angel had a, a revolving sword that would have decapitated Bilam and the donkey. Bilam didn't see it, but the donkey did. And the donkey sat and refused to move. So Bilam hit his donkey and the donkey continued moving and he strayed from the path but the, and he went onto the grass instead and what got, got by the angel. He was being hit. Then um, the, 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 his, the Malach, the angel came again and um, and, the, and 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 it, it was um, and and the donkey saw it and the donkey went aside and he actually he actually uh, it was by crumbing there was vineyards and and you know Bilam was cut by the vineyards by the leaves by the twigs by the berries by the, by the thorns by right he was by the bush he was cut and he hit the donkey again and the donkey continued traveling on his way and then the angel stood right near a pile of rocks. And the donkey had to squeeze by the pile of rocks and it actually crushed the leg of Bilam and actually broke his leg or sprained his leg, whatever it was. And they say that they, 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 they call it a pile of rocks and we're taught that this pile of rocks was the same rocks that Jacob and Lavan made when they said no one should cross this barrier this pile of rocks to do harm and here was Bilam, a grandson of Lavan, crossing these rocks to do harm so he was hurt by these rocks and he broke his leg or sprained his leg and he whipped the donkey again and the donkey opened up its mouth it was one of the things that were, that god created on the sixth day right before sundown right before the end of creation one of the things god created he created the rainbow he created the well of miriam he created the first tongues he also created the the the, the uh, he created the, the the earth that will swallow korah he created some mystical things that the sea shall split he created that this donkey should open its mouth and talk to Bilam. and the donkey opened its mouth and goes why'd you hit me these three times so Bilam says, because you defied me these three times. See, because I defied you for a reason. And then God saw the angel. Now, this actually was a tremendous embarrassment. Tremendous embarrassment for Bilam. He was Bilam going to curse with his mouth the people, and he couldn't even get his donkey into shape. Furthermore, he couldn't even see the angel until then. What kind of prophet are you? So it was all down to bring it was all done to bring him down a peg or two. And so Bilam now saw the angel. Um, after this dialogue, the, 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 the donkey said, Have I ever done this to you before? Have I ever defied you before? He goes, So think about it. Before you hit me, think about it. So he said, Oh my goodness. And then he saw the angel. So Bilam said, uh, uh, okay, I won't go, I'll go back. And the angel said, no, 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 you come this far, go. But you should know that the donkey saved your life because if the donkey would have walked past me, I would have actually let her live and killed you. So have a little bit more respect for your donkey, which once again, this is all ridiculous talk. But, you know, it's a la-la land, but it was made to embarrass him specifically. 
So he continued going. Bollock came running towards him and Bollock said to him, why did you delay in coming to me? I want to give you honor. I want to, I, I want to do all nice things for you. And he says, if you give me all the money in the world, I can only speak what Hashem puts in my mouth. That sets up the stage for, for failure. So Bilam continued and Bilam said to Balak, let me see the people you want to curse. So he took him up to the hill and he saw in the valley, he saw the Jewish people living side by side, as far as the eye can see, you know, hundreds and thousands of tents pitched. And, um, and, and he said, okay, let me offer up some sacrifices. And he said, let, let me be alone while I offer. And he offered up the sacrifice. He said, God, I'm ready to do my service. So he came back to Balak and he opened his mouth. And what he said basically was a blessing, not a curse. How can I curse what God has not cursed? How can I anger what Hashem is not angry at? Right? I see the, 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 the patriarchs and the matriarchs. I see the rocks and the hills. And uh, it's a nation that dwells in solitude and it's not ranked amongst the nations. Um, who can count the dust of Jacob? Right? May my soul die the death of their death, an upright death. Right? And all this was blessings and code. And basically, he was saying that, that the Jewish people that live in solitude, they don't recognize that. They're not concerned about what the Goyim say. So the Goyim say it's in vogue to eat pig. Torah says you don't eat pig. The Goyim say that it's in vogue to do X, Y, and Z. The Jewish people don't do X, Y, and Z. And he says that, that, the, that the, the, who can count the amount of people that have lived before the children of Jacob that will be resurrected. That I want their end to be like them. I too want to be resurrected. Bollock was furious. He goes, I asked you to curse and you blessed. So he says, I can only do God's bidding. And it was almost like, like Bilam's free will was taken as is explained in the Talmud that God had a fish hook at Bilam's mouth and he opened it like a ventriloquist. He opened it and closed it at will. I, by the way, had the same thing. I had, once I had this surgery that I had, I had this, this um, Inspire placed into me. So, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night and my tongue was pulled against my will in order to open the airway. So I'm, the, I'm, I'm Bill on Jr. My, I'm also have this fish hook on my tongue. Literally I have an electric lead that pushes and push and pulls at will, not at my will. So he says, okay, let me try again. And he offered up more sacrifices and he proceeded to bless them again. Right. And, um, and, 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 um, and he said, uh, God is not a man that he should be deceitful, right? Behold, I have given them a blessing and Israel is blessed by Isaac. I have not contradicted. I haven't seen any reason to curse. They, they're tzaddikim. Anyway, and there's no, there's no in, in fact, the Jewish people don't have this thing. They don't have sorcery and divination or anything like that. And he, and, and, and he went crazy, Balak. He says, come on, will you? So he says, I told you. He says, let's try it again. So this time, Bilam didn't even wait for God to curse, uh, to, to even attempt for God to put in his mouth. He just said blessings. He didn't even wait for God to speak. He, on his own accord, he started to give um, prophecy, right? He says, the word of the one who hears the sayings of God, how goodly are your tents, Matovo, Alecha, Yaakov, how you dwell together, which is a message to us that we can always be blessed if, we, if there's unity amongst us. And um, water shall flow and seeds shall grow, etc. You lay down like a lion. Right now you're a lion club. You're not a lion cub. You're not ready to attack. But you will. You will at some point. Bullock clapped his hands. He said, Oi, 
I wanted to honor you. God has thwarted that honor. Go, I'm not giving you gold and silver. Go, run to the rock you crawl from. So Balaam said, I'm not a total failure, Balak. Not a total failure. While it's true I failed now, let me give you a prophecy that will happen at the end of time. He says, behold, you're safe. You're not going to be killed now. The Israelites are actually not going to attack you. Right? He says that 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 um, it, it, it it's they will, and it goes into this whole thing. Edom should be a conquest. Seir should be a conquest. But um, and 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 uh, Amalek should be destroyed. And and he saw the the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Moabites, and he says the Jewish people will destroy them and will lay waste, and Assyria will be destroyed. But not now. And Bilam said, so you have nothing to fear. But eventually, you will be destroyed. So there was a sigh of relief that them and their kids are not going to be destroyed. It's going to be another, I don't know how many years, 800 years or whatever it was until, uh, until the destruction um, of, uh, I don't know if it's uh, that many. I, don't, I really don't know. I'm bad at this. Um, until, until they're destroyed, so you can all sigh a sigh of relief. Um, and he said, however, and this is the commentaries get, the Midrash gets from the way the word is wording. He says, I'm gonna give you advice to be able to bring them down. No curse in the world is gonna bring them down. You can try and kill them, they're not, they're not killable. Right? They're going to survive the Romans. They're going to survive the Greeks, the old story. They're going to survive the Nazis. They're going to survive the Inquisitions. They're going to survive. He says, but I will tell you how you can hurt them. You'll never destroy them. Right? You'll never be able to get rid of them completely, but you can decimate their numbers. And that is assimilate them. Assimilate them. Um, let them let them, you can water down their numbers by giving your daughters to their sons. Therefore, their children will be not Jewish and the kids that they have will be not Jewish. And that angers God tremendously. Now, there's a book, there's a book by a Victor Miller that was written in his lifetime, but only published posthumously because it's too much of a um, fire and brimstone book. The book is called A Divine Madness, A Divine Teaching of the Holocaust. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not required reading. And I, I'm not even suggesting this book. But Avigdor Miller traces that in Germany, the first city to fall by the Third Reich was the first city to close its yeshiva. The second city that to fall and Jews, you know, killed and and uh, and and ex exported to to eventually to to labor camps and extermination camps, was a city that assimilated, and most of the people there um, had really no connection, right? So it didn't happen in Poland where they were studying, or Russia, where they were studying, studying, or Lithuania, or Ukraine, right? Or Latvia, right? It, it, right? it, it happened in Germany. That was the headquarters, right? Eventually it spread out as the Reich spread, but it was headquartered in a, in a few cities, right? It was headquartered, and, and, um, and in fact, Frankfurt, by the way, which was a major Jewish cosmopolitan city where great people lived there at the times of the war, right? Was, was one of the cities that Hitler was actually avoided. It didn't have as much Nazi support. Yes, yes, they did kill 12,000 people. They did export 12,000 people, but it tells in comparison of what lived there, right? It, 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 because Frankfurt 
was more of a holy city than these other cities that Hitler destroyed, than Berlin. Right. So 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 Frankfurt um, was was actually spared a lot of the madness. In fact, I don't know if you know history. When when Hitler came to Frankfurt to to speak, he was unbelievable that he was actually booed. And the 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 um, I forget their name. Those that, that opposed Germans that opposed Hitler, they were headquartered in Frankfurt. So Hitler only came once to Frankfurt. And he didn't actually get such a warm reception. The Nazis took over the 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 um, the, the building still remains as, as the financial district. At that time, it was the cattle district. It was the cattle district. It was a huge building, and that's where Jews were gathered before they were exported. Um, so so they did come in, but then Hitler kind of avoided it like the plague. Um, so it's just that's his book, and that's what Bilam was telling. Bala, get him where it hurts, right? You, you'll, you'll beat him, you'll, ne you'll never beat him. Their, their star, as he said, their, their, their star will never set. Yeah, but, but you can get him if you assimilate their numbers, right? If, 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 they, if, they, um, if they begin to lose their identity, that's the best way. And the next verse in the Torah is they lost their way. It says they started, the first thing it says is they started Liznois. They started to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. Right? So the daughters of Moab started to walk into the, where the Jews were encamped, which they never walked in before. And they, they um, started to flirt. Right. Harlotry. They weren't just women scantily dressed, minding their own business, right? Which is, you know, you can't blame the victim for a rape, right? You can't. And, and no matter how short the skirt is or the pants are, right? Short shorts, you can't. It's, and it's wrong, and it, and it was wrong then, it's wrong now. But they weren't doing that. They were harlots. And there were women that weren't harlots by profession. But they were brought in, and even a princess of Moab, as we'll soon see, right, lowered herself in order to destroy the Jew. That's the first thing they did. Then the next verse is by Tikrena La'om. They invited the people, right? Invited the Jewish people to feast, to worship to their gods. Ka'or was the one in specific, as, as the Torah says. And the people ate and drank. And they worshipped to their gods. Now, why do you need to know they ate and drank? It's because Pa'or, as the Torah says to Baal Pa'or, the way to worship Baal Pa'or was to defecate to it. So some have you bow, some have you have throw rocks, Margolis, you throw rocks, some you spit, some you go through fire, and some you defecate. Baal Pa'or was, 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 was the was the idol that actually brought the Jewish people down, that they caused them to lose 24,000 people. Was the, was, was, so it started with harlotry. And from harlotry, the daughters, didn't say the sons enticed the women. It said the daughters enticed, right? Because as we know, uh, if, 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 if you have a child with a non-Jewish woman, your, your child is not Jewish. There's no way it could be Jewish. And eventually they came to eat and drink and, and, and celebrate and party. Now, um, they ate and drank, by the way, the Torah tells us, is because if they just stuck, stuck to mana, one of the complaints against the mana a couple of weeks ago is the Jewish people said, it has no waste. Mana is 1000% nutritious and has no waste. Here they eat and drink, Right, they eat and drink, um, you know, whatever they ate and drank. Um, it was, it did produce waste, and then they were able to serve Balpaor. So Balpaor, by the way, was 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 an interesting story. One of the reasons why Moshe was buried outside of, of Israel is because Paor always represented a threat to the Jewish people. 
For some reason, it was this, there was Baal and Baal Peor, two idols that the Jewish people couldn't get enough of. So there was Baal, which Elijah took care of, but Baal Peor, which, which, which was basically assimilation um, through celebration. So parties, raves, right? Discos. Um, and and um, and, and uh, Macarena, da, 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 right? So um, that so Moshe was buried. Moshe was buried near Paor, near the idol. So Moshe buried the idol. And then when Moshe passed, they say Moshe's burial place assured that Paor remained buried and was no longer a threat. Just an interesting. An interesting commentary. So the people were were, um, were were having sex through the night, through these um, with, with these with these newfound harlots who weren't really harlots. And it says the Ish, one man of the Jewish people, came to one woman of the Jewish people. The next portion, which we'll discuss next week, says who it was. It was a prince of the Jewish people. His name was Cosby. No relation to Bill Cosby, even though they're both sexually defective um, with, 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 um, with Zimri. The Torah tells us was a princess. So you had the prince of a tribe, prince of a tribe, right? You, you know, you have many congressmen and two senators, but you only have one governor. It was one governor, the prince. And he, in the street, in the sand, which for the life of me, didn't make, doesn't make any sense to me, was having sex in front of Moshe and the Jewish people. And the Talmud fills in the blanks. The Talmud said it went something like this. Cosby was walking hand in hand you know, flirtatiously with Zimri. And there's Moshe, and there's Moshe's entourage, Aaron, others, elders. And he says, Moshe, are you allowed to have sex with the Midianite? So Moshe says, no. He goes, oh no, oh no. Who was your wife? A Midianite. Hmm. Um, Elaza. Aaron's son, Aaron already passed. Are you allowed to have sex with a Midianite? Elazar says no. He goes, ah, oh, who did you marry? The daughter of a Midianite. So he goes, so basically what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. So you're hypocrites. And right then and there, they disrobed. And, and it was debauchery. It was, it was um, what did someone tell me? There's a place in, 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 in Nevada, it's not in Las Vegas. It's in Reno that basically that it's just a house of, of ill repute where you don't have to go into a room. Um, and, and, um, and they did it right in front of Moshe. And, um, and, and it says that, 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 that Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aaron Hakohen, who was not a Kohen, because he was, he was, God said that Aaron and his sons shall be Kohanim and anybody born after. Pinchas fell between the cracks. He was not a Kohen. Because he was the only one that was born and God didn't mention him by name. He took a spear, as the Torah tells us, and he took a spear and he put it through Cosby and Zimri through their genitalia to prove a point and he killed them. And the Torah portion ends that the plague that God brought upon the Jewish people, there was a plague where they died instantly. It was like a, an instant COVID. Um, 24,000 people died. Now, that number is very significant, by the way, and he stopped the plague. Next week, we'll talk about Pinchas, et cetera. But the reason why that 24,000 number is significant is because the Jewish people had 603,550 by the last count. 
you add 22,000 Levium to that count. What does that equal? 225,550. You kill 24 of them, 24,000 of them. You are now at 601,000, right? If the Jewish people went below 600,000, they could not enter Israel. They had to have that magic number, that quorum of 600,000. So if Pinnacles would not have done what he would have done, and 25,000, 26,000, 30,000, the Jewish people would have to recoup their numbers before going into Israel. So that number was significant that Pinchas took action before they got to a terrible number. 24,000 is a tremendous loss, right? Tremendous loss. Um, and especially if you only number 600,000, right? They say that when, when the 9-11 happened and 3,000 people died, it was equivalent to 600,000 Israelis being killed. That was like the percentages. So you take 24,000 out of 600,000, it's a big number. But Pinchas stopped it before it hit critical mass and the Jews would have been in trouble. So Pinchas was a zealot. And the question is, what is zealotry, right? The question is, why didn't Moshe stand up and do it to stop the plague? Why didn't Eliezer? Why didn't the, the, and the Pinchas didn't even ask, Pinchas got up. So that's a cliffhanger. We'll leave it to next week. Is zealotry accepted or not? He took matters on his, in his own hands out of a deep anger and he killed the offenders who, by the way, the punishment, punishment is that death? If you, if you screw in the street, is it death? If you, if you have sex with an aren't you? So, so, uh, so we'll talk about that next week, but so he, he did it, he did it. Did he have a right to do it? Is that, is that a biblical command? Is it biblically prescribed? We look at the Torah, nowhere, by the way, does it say that you have to kill somebody to have sex with an anju. Doesn't say it. It's a sin, yes. Capital punishment, being stabbed in, 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 um, most intimate area, right? And it's, it's uh, you know, we all know it's very painful when, you know, if somebody kicks you, a spear there, oh my goodness. Um, what's the scoop here? So we'll, t we'll talk a, a um, it's a cliffhanger. So Dr. Goldman, this is, you're gonna have to be here next week in order to, um, you know, to, to be here. Um, Thank you. So God bless, the, the, um, we'll resume. High Academy resumes, resumes tomorrow. Tomorrow, um, you know, we're in the middle of a course, fascinating Jewish personalities. So we did Shabtai Tzvi this past week. We, um, you know, we, so, so we, we did the Vilna Goen this past week. Interesting, interesting people. Um, we'll see you tomorrow, one o'clock, High Academy. God bless. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.